Hi folks, it's me, Kate Schatz, and I am here to read to you uh, the first story from Miriam Kleinstahl and my book, Rad American History A to Z. Um, the book is an A to Z illustrated book of radical moments and movements from American history. And we intend to focus on diverse radical histories that maybe don't show up in history books, um, maybe aren't as familiar to a lot of folks, uh, but that we think really show essential, um, powerful, beautiful, um, sometimes not so beautiful, but very real aspects of um, our really fascinating American histories. And the first story in the book is A is for Alcatraz. Um, and so in this story, what we're gonna learn about is um, we're gonna learn a lot about the history of Native American uh, people in this country, a little bit about the uh, longer ago history, um, but we are gonna learn about something that happened um, on the island of Alcatraz, which is in the San Francisco Bay. Um, and the story takes place in the year 1969. And the illustration is by Miriam Kleinstahl. It's a paper cut based on a real photo um, with a watercolor uh, painting behind it. Um, so um, before I read the story, I wanted to give um, viewers a few things to listen for as I'm reading. Um, I want you to listen for um, things that are familiar to you. So that might be in um, locations, specific cities and locations that are mentioned, um, um, kind of uh, political movements or moments that maybe you've heard of and learned about in school. Um, so I want you to listen to things that are familiar, and then I want you to listen for things that are really unfamiliar, things that get your attention, things where you're like, ah, I've never heard of that, or I didn't know that. Things, so things you wanna learn more about. Um, that's my favorite uh, thing about reading histories is I always am looking to find out things that I don't already know, something that jumps out at me and I go, wait, I, I don't know anything about that. Um, so that's what I want you to pay attention to as I'm reading. Uh, when I'm done reading the story, reading the story is gonna take me about 10 minutes, 10 to 12 minutes to read it. And after I read the story, I'm gonna give you guys some kind of guiding questions for those of you who might wanna um, take this story and this information and extend your learning by doing some um, research on your own. Okay, here we go. A is for Alcatraz and the Indian occupation of 1969. It was 2 a.m. on a chilly November night when the first boats set sail for the rocky island in the middle of San Francisco Bay. Alcatraz, the site of the infamous federal prison that once housed gangster Al Capone, had been abandoned and unused for years. The people on board the boats huddled together with their sleeping bags and backpacks, hearts racing as they made the crossing. The 79 women and men on the boat had several things in common. They were all college students. They were all activists. And though they came from different tribes, they were all Native American. And they were planning to take over Alcatraz, also known as the Rock, to protest centuries of injustices committed against their people. Would the Coast Guard stop them? Or would they make it onto Alcatraz? Would their plan actually work? And if they did make it, what would happen next? Now the story goes back in time a little bit to give you a broader context for this particular moment that we're gonna be learning more about in a little bit. So the late 1960s were a time of tremendous social, political, and cultural transformation all across America, but especially in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is where I was born and raised and still live. Radical change was everywhere you looked, from the Black Panthers serving free breakfast to children in West Oakland, to free speech rallies and anti-Vietnam War demonstrations in Berkeley, to long-haired hippies and the summer of love in the hate Ashbury neighborhood of San Francisco. And okay, because I'm reading this at my house, I guess I can do things like this on my bookshelf. I actually have a picture of my mom, one of those original, <laughs> I guess she doesn't have long hair in this picture. Um, my dad definitely did. So that is my mom, Barbara. She was an original hippie. <laughs> Sorry, mom, put you in the video. <laughs> I love that picture of her. That was from like, I might have been like 1965. She'll correct me and I'll, I'll, I'll let you know in a future video. Anyway, as I was saying, all kinds of stuff going on in the Bay Area in the 1960s. And a lot of it happened at colleges and universities. So that might have been UC Berkeley, uh, San Francisco State, UC Davis, UCLA down in Los Angeles. 
Um, and more and more students were becoming politically active. They were questioning war and income inequality and cultural conformity. Ethnic groups who'd long been marginalized from mainstream American life were coming together to denounce racism and demand recognition and equality. And they were demanding that recognition and equality in larger society, but also at their own colleges and universities. Uh, the Indian students who were on that boat heading to Alcatraz had been a big part of that particular movement. So a lot of them had actually met through the Third World Liberation Front, which was a coalition, which means like a, like a group of Black, Latino, Asian, and Native American student groups at California colleges that spoke out against the lack of diversity on campuses and in their curricula. They held a months long strike in 1968 and then again in 1969 that led to the creation of the very first ethnic studies department in the country. Um, by the way, my mom went to San Francisco State around that time. Uh, this whole movement empowered the Indian students who were, far, who were part of the first generation of Native Americans to attend college and to continue uh, and inspired them to continue their activism. So now we're back on those boats. Two in the morning, it's dark out. The boats made it to Alcatraz, where the lighthouse emitted a steady beam and the cell blocks towered above empty and dark. The new Alcatraz residents saw the twinkling lights of San Francisco, Oakland, and Berkeley across the bay. They saw the Coast Guard ships headed their way with powerful searchlights sweeping the dark waters. They found their way to the empty cells and unrolled their sleeping bags to get some rest but not before they celebrated by drumming and singing songs. They didn't know what the morning would bring, but these committed organizers believed in what they were doing. They didn't know that more boats full of native people would come in the days to follow. They didn't know that they'd end up on the front page of the newspaper, that hundreds of people would soon join them for a massive Thanksgiving feast. And they had no idea that this occupation of Alcatraz would last for 19 months. It would capture the attention of the entire nation, and it would lead to historic legislative and cultural change. Now we're gonna go back in time and history a little bit again. So the history of indigenous Native American residents and European immigrants spans several centuries of struggle, heartbreak, resilience, and survival. From the earliest days of the Europeans' arrival in the New World, Indigenous North Americans have fought to retain their land, their cultures and customs, and their lives. In the effort to claim as much land as possible, white Americans used violence and war, as well as legal tactics like treaties and federal policies. During the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries, almost 400 treaties were ratified between the American government and Native American tribes. Nearly all of them have been broken, violated, or changed by the government to suit its own needs. The 19th century government policies of manifest destiny and westward expansion saw native people forced off their ancestral lands and placed onto reservations. During the later part of the 19th century, a series of off reservation boarding schools were set up in order to civilize Indian children and to teach them the proper ways of white people. Native children were taken from their families, often by force, and made to cut their hair, dress in proper clothes, convert to Christianity, and speak English only. These policies devastated Indian families, many of whom resisted the removal of their children and were punished by police. To manage all the land that it was taking, the government created something called the Bureau of Indian Affairs in 1824. Over 100 years later, um, in 1950, that bureau was led by the same man who oversaw the mass incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. Um, and then it says, see page 65, and we'll get to that in a few days. Um, K is for Korematsu in this book, and it's a story of Fred Korematsu, a Japanese American who stood up for his civil liberties um, during World War II, during the mass incarceration of Japanese Americans. So we'll get to that. Uh, but again, the man who oversaw that whole policy um, was overseeing the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and he announced a new policy of termination. It was called the Termination Policy. It was intended to break up the Indian reservation system 
um, and disband tribes, so breaking up the tribes. Um, it intended to sell Indian land back to the government and to then relocate Indians to urban areas so that they could assimilate by losing their distinct identities and becoming like normal Americans, AKA white Americans. So again, the termination policy was really this move to uh, force Native American people off of their uh, ancestral lands, which were often rural, um, and into urban areas where the idea was they need to just get jobs, move to the city, um, and be like regular people, not Indians. Um, so thousands and thousands of Native people and their families ended up moving um, in the 1950s and 60s from rural lands to cities like Oakland, uh, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. Indians arriving in these new cities found very little support though. And so by the mid 1960s, more than 40,000 Indians from nearly a hundred tribal groups lived in the San Francisco Bay area. And the majority of them worked very low paying jobs. They faced discrimination and police brutality. They struggled to access decent schools, affordable housing. And it was very hard to feel a sense of community. Tribal identity was nearly impossible to maintain. And I don't say this in the book because have to edit it down to fit it all in the book. But a big part of what happened is that uh, people felt a lot of shame about being Native American. So a lot of children were raised to deny it. Um, some children who were Native American didn't even know that they were Native American because their parents didn't talk about it because there was so much shame. Um, there were a lot of stereotypes in the media in the 1950s and 60s. Um, a lot of Western films, if you've ever seen an old Western, Indians were usually portrayed as kind of violent um, kind of savage people. Um, and, and there were no portrayals of Native Americans as just regular uh, people. They're, they were they were extremely stereotyped. So there was a lot of shame um, and people didn't have a strong cultural identity. Um, and again, to fit in and to try to succeed, they often denied that identity. So it was this lengthy history of trauma and loss that the Alcatraz occupiers brought with them. So most of those college students on the boats heading out to Alcatraz were the children and grandchildren of those Indians who had been forcibly removed from their homes, sent to boarding schools and assimilated. This new generation was ready to reclaim their Indian identity as well as their land. So when they got to Alcatraz, they released a public proclamation that began, we, the Native Americans, reclaim the land known as Alcatraz Island in the name of all American Indians. They cited an 1868 treaty the United States had signed with the Sioux tribe, exerting their right to claim unused federal land. So this treaty had actually said that um, uh, the United States government would take over all this land from the Sioux, but that in the future, unused federal property could belong to, uh, to Native people. Alcatraz prison was closed in 1963, so it was just empty and being unused, so it was unused federal land. The occupiers laid out a vision. They had a whole vision for what they wanted to build on Alcatraz. Uh, they wanted to create a center for Native American studies, an American Indian spiritual center, an Indian center of ecology, an arts and crafts center, and a restaurant serving traditional Indian foods. One of the lead occupiers, a woman named Lenata Warjack, and remember that name because I'm gonna talk about her in a little bit, uh, worked with a local architecture firm and they built a scale model of this whole vision they had for Alcatraz. Within days of the occupation, the abandoned buildings and desolate landscape were transformed. Signs that had read United States property soon proclaimed United Indian property. And the words Indian land were spray painted all over the island. And if you go to Alcatraz now, that spray paint um, in many cases is still there. So this is actually an illustration of what you see when you pull up to Alcatraz on a ferry that takes you from San Francisco out to the island. So they have preserved that graffiti. Teepees were built and strategy meetings were held inside of them. A small team of women and men took on leadership roles and they spent their days communicating with journalists, negotiating with politicians, and debating the best strategies to get their important messages out to the world. Everyone pitched in and took on a job. There was food prep, security detail, sanitation crew, um, a nurse opened up a health clinic, three women started a childcare center and a school because there were also lots of kids there. Um, and parents volunteered to teach traditional school subjects as well as native history. So the children learned some of the games, songs, and art that government boarding schools had once tried to erase from their grandparents. Um, and 
There were a number of kids that were on Alcatraz. A lot of people who came were parents. Um, and so there was this whole generation of young children that actually grew up for this, this about a year on Alcatraz, um, kind of running around. And um, a lot of them have shared their stories about what it was like to, to grow up there. Um, one of my favorite details is that they would get all these donations of clothing um, from people back on the mainland. And a lot of it was stuff that wasn't practical, like uh, like fancy dresses and men's suits and high heels. So they had a dress up pile where all these kids uh, would just come and play dress up and all these donated clothes. Anyway, back on the mainland, federal and city officials grappled with how to deal with this occupation. Suddenly there's like all these people living on Alcatraz. At first, the uh, public officials wanted to send the Coast Guard to force everyone off the island, but the occupation had overwhelming public support. People liked it, people supported them. People felt like Native Americans did have the right to be out there and they supported their demands. Um, so the officials decided to wait it out, assuming the occupiers would eventually give up. In the meantime, money, food, clothing, and supplies poured in from supporters all over the country. Over the next 19 months, more than 5,000 people came to Alcatraz. Many came just for a day to see what it was all about. Journalists and artists, sightseers and hippies, families with children, and curious college students. But most of those who came were Indians of all ages, many of whom traveled long distances to get there. There were college students from Oregon and Southern California, elders from reservations in Kansas, Arizona, and New Mexico, even indigenous people from Mexico and Canada came. All these Indians had distinct customs, languages, and identities, but they felt a common bond on Alcatraz. Every evening, people came together around blazing campfires to dance, tell stories, and share laughter and memories. The people of Alcatraz weren't there just to make a political statement. They were also creating a community. While some had lived on reservations their entire lives, others had been young children when their families relocated to cities. For many, it was their first experience spending time around other Indians outside of their immediate family. A sense of Indianness was celebrated, especially among those who'd grown up feeling ashamed or unaware of their heritage, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, the occupiers published a nationally distributed newsletter. They also started a radio station called Radio Free Alcatraz. Uh, Grace Thorpe, who was the daughter of Olympic medalist and football star Jim Thorpe, who was a really famous uh, football player uh, back in the day, uh, she was there and she coordinated publicity and she got a lot of donations of money and supplies. Um, and a lot of celebrities really supported a lot of famous bands at the time, like the Grateful Dead and Creedence Clearwater Revival and all these different celebrity activists came to Alcatraz and sent money and supplies. People across the country, including the president, who was Richard Nixon, were finally paying attention to the voices and struggles of Indians. In July 1970, just over seven months into the Alcatraz occupation, President Richard Nixon announced an end to the termination policy. Remember, that was the really devastating policy from the 1950s that forced people off reservations and into cities. Uh, Nixon declared it ineffective and demeaning. Back on Alcatraz, this was seen as a victory, but organizers knew the fight was far from over. The Leadership Council continued to negotiate with the government who wanted the occupiers off the island immediately, but they also didn't want to uh, risk public outrage by kicking them out. The council knew that staying on the island was the only way to have enough leverage to get the rest of their demands met. But here's the thing, life on Alcatraz was not easy. Um, the occupation did begin to struggle after a while. Um, a lot of the college students had to leave and return to school. And for a lot of people, the living conditions were too harsh. It was winter, it was cold and rainy, and they were in an empty, abandoned concrete prison with no heat. Some people felt that the occupiers had already made their point, um, and some did feel that the leaders lacked a long-term strategy, like a real plan for what they were gonna do. Other people were unhappy with the kind of waves of new people who'd come to stay on the island, who didn't always share the peaceful vision of the original occupiers. By the end of May, 1971, the government had cut off all utility service to the island. The public responded by donating generators for electricity and barrels of fresh water. On June 11, 1971, 19 months after the first boats arrived, the occupation of Alcatraz came to an end when three Coast Guard vessels and a helicopter arrived filled with armed FBI agents. The final 15 occupiers left peacefully without the deed to the land. But the impact of the Alcatraz occupation went far beyond the physical presence of people on the island. 
It transformed public perception of urban Indians, strengthened the American Indian movement, and helped shape federal Indian policy for decades. In the wake of the occupation, Congress passed several major pieces of legislation, including the Indian Self-Determination and Education Act and the Indian Health Care Act. Sacred land was returned to tribes in New Mexico, Alaska, and Washington, and many of the occupiers became leaders within Native American communities as professors, scholars, activists, filmmakers, and tribal leaders. Grace Thorpe worked closely with members of Congress to advocate for Native American communities, and Wilma Mankiller, who was a struggling young mother when she came to Alcatraz, was inspired to return to her tribal land in Oklahoma, where she became the first woman elected as chief of the Cherokee Nation and became one of America's most important 20th century Native American leaders. And if you've read our book, Rod American Women A to Z, uh, W is for Wilma in that book. So as scholar um, Dr. Lamada Warjack says, and this is a quote from her, and um, I mentioned that you should remember her name because she's actually someone I interviewed um, for this story and she read uh, the drafts and uh, gave me a lot of feedback to make sure that this was um, told as accurately as possible. And so this is a quote from Lenata. She says, the victories were hard to see at the time, but they came into fruition later on. It was the re-identification. We reclaimed our identity. It was okay to be native and we no longer had to be ashamed. And once you identify as native, you wanna know more about your tribe, your culture, your language, your ceremony, your songs. On Alcatraz and in the years that followed, a spirit of native pride identity and resistance was reborn. And that's our story of Alcatraz in Rad American History A to Z. And um, again, when I interviewed Lenata, and, and I can talk more about my research process for the book, um, you know, to do a story like that, I did a lot of different kinds of research. I read books, I read articles, I watched some documentaries, I visited Alcatraz. Um, and I read a lot of oral histories, which are stories told by the people who were there. Um, but it was really important to me to try to talk to someone who had actually been there, um, both to get their insight and their stories, but also to make sure that I was telling the story as respectfully as possible. Um, and that I was emphasizing what really needed to be emphasized. I'm not Native American. Um, I wasn't there. Uh, and I wanted to have great respect for the culture and the experience that those folks had. So in talking to Dr. Warjack, one of the biggest things that she did suggest that I emphasize was the intensity of this feeling of togetherness and Indianness and kind of cultural pride that people were able to feel that she, as a young college student, was really able to feel. Um, and so I was really honored to be able to talk with her and to get her feedback on the story. So a couple of points that I thought I would... Um, kind of indicate for those of you who um, think this is interesting and need something to do today and want to do a little bit more um, research here. Um, to go back to the beginning, I think there's some different movements and groups that um, would be interesting for folks to research. So um, in general, I always think that the history of the 1960s and the different movements, specifically um, um, ethnic movements, um, that I mentioned here, um, the Black Panthers who served free breakfast to children in West Oakland. The story of the Black Panthers is fascinating. Um, in particular, that story of how they began feeding children in their community, um, especially in times like this, when we're thinking about how do communities support each other? How can we care for our children um, and care for our communities in a time of crisis? I think that that is a beautiful story to learn more about. Um, I also think that the Third World Liberation Front, that's a really interesting story that doesn't get told very often. Um, if you've ever taken an ethnic studies class, um, maybe in high school or in college, um, that the reason we have ethnic studies, the reason that we have opportunities to study um, history with a, with a kind of focus on race and ethnicity and the experiences of people from different communities and cultures um, really comes out of these student activists. Um, and the history and controversy of ethnic studies is also an interesting thing to study. Um, there are a lot of movements in a lot of states like Arizona to eliminate ethnic studies. Um, and so that could be an interesting thing for young people to research. Why do some people think that it's a problem to have ethnic studies? Um, why did some people fight passionately for it? Um, another thing to point to that you might think about as a potential discussion question is the choice of words. I'm very intentional when I write these books. I'm very intentional with my language. And you may have noticed that I referred to um, on page six, 
um, I talked about, I say the history of indigenous Native American residents and European immigrants. Um, and I intentionally refer to uh, European immigrants in this in throughout the book um, when I talk about like the pilgrims and the original um, white people and white settlers who came to America sometimes we call them the colonists there's a lot of different phrases we can use but I feel that it's important to also refer to them as immigrants um, we are living in a time when people who do come to the United States from other countries are often vilified um, and uh, we have a lot of anti-immigrant sentiment um, but the original white people who came here, they were immigrants too, they were European immigrants. So I really intentionally use that phrase in the book. Um, and so that might be an th interesting thing for people to consider. Um, do you agree with me? Do you agree with that choice? Why or why not? Um, and let's see. I also think that for those of you who are interested in the history of Native Americans um, in this country, um, you know, you could go much deeper on some of the things I mentioned, um, treaties, the history of treaties, how those treaties were created and negotiated and then violated um, with the government and with different Native American groups. Um, the history of the boarding schools. I would say that this is one of the hardest and most emotionally difficult things for me to research and to learn about. It's not something I learned about as a young person in high school or middle school or even college. Um, and it's pretty devastating, but I think that if you, if it, that seems interesting to you, I think it's a very important thing to learn about um, how that actually happened, how children were forcibly removed from their families and forced to go to schools. Um, and there's, um, yeah, there's a whole long history of, of that and, and also the ways that Native um, people resisted that. Um, similarly, the, the kind of um, migration of a lot of Native communities from rural lands um, into urban areas, I think is a great thing to research. Um, and then I would also say that if, again, if you're interested, the American Indian movement, um, and you know, it's not that Alcatraz started the American Indian movement. There was a lot of other activism going on in other parts of the country and a lot of other players. Um, but that is another one of these um, kind of social movements of the late 1960s, early 70s that uh, is really, really fascinating and often pretty misunderstood. So those are some discussion topics um, for you. I hope you learned something. Um, if you want to leave a comment, tell me something you learned, ask me any questions, um, I'm happy to address those. And that's A is for Alcatraz. Thank you for joining. Tune in for the next uh, installment, which will be B is for Black Lives Matter. Thanks, everyone.